speakers with us today. And in a departure from our usual format, we're going to let them dialogue with each other. There will be time for a Q&A at the end, but it's not going to be lectures as such. Um, we have uh, as our interlocutor David Ree, who is an English teacher at New Trier High School. Um, and somehow also manages, I think he never sleeps, uh, to act a great deal in the Chicago area. Um, most recently he was in a Broadway cabaret with Silk Road Theater, and he's also acted many of the prime roles of Asian American theater, including M. Butterfly, and appeared on Broadway in Thoroughly Modern Millie, um, with which he also made some other TV appearances. He's also been on Law and Order, I believe. Got it all right here. <laughs> um, and we're also very pleased to have with us playwright Philip Congotanda, who is one of the most important and influential Asian American playwrights. Um, many of you are familiar with his play Yankee Dog You Die, which is one of his best known. But he has many, many others and has worked with a whole list of incredible theater companies, uh, to name a few, the Asian American Theater Company, American Conservatory Theater, uh, Berkeley Rep, East West Players, and uh, he has also done work internationally with the Royal National Theater in London and um, the Mingate Theater in Tokyo. And right now, um, he's in the process of developing a play, again with Silk Road Theater in Chicago, called The DNA Trail, which is a collaboration among several playwrights, including um, also David Henry Kwong. And uh, this is a play about uh, heredity and race. All the playwrights took DNA tests to determine their <coughs> heredity uh, and wrote plays inspired by this new science. And there's actually a lot going on this weekend for that. Um, all the playwrights will be appearing at Columbia College in a special event tomorrow afternoon. So if you're interested in going to that, I have the information. You can ask me for that after. And uh, also, Asian American Studies will probably be putting together a little outing to go see the play when it opens in March. So there will be more information about that coming your way soon. So please give a warm welcome to our two speakers. And enjoy the night. I'm David Reed. Um, I guess I'll just uh, talk a little bit about how I got into the business. Um, I, I was actually in academia when I decided to become an actor. Um, <clears throat> I was actually in the middle of my doctorate at the time. Um, I was doing a comparative study between uh, Korean and English literature, American literature, and specifically looking at post-colonial uh, war literature. And um, uh, I don't know how you guys did to do it, because I hate it. I mean, I, I, I was Korean. And I was actually sitting in the first ever Starbucks at the Ihua campus in Seoul, Korea. And I was, I was sitting there uh, reading Korean poetry, and all I was thinking was, I don't care. You know, I was just completely just um, uh, separated from what I was reading, you know. So I, I um, called my parents, and it was a good thing. My parents live in Chicago, and um, I called them from Korea, because I could have done it you know, face to face. And I said, I'm going to stop. He was like, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be an actor. <laughs> you know, it was, my dad and I are very close, so um, it was one of those things I was telling them right beforehand that uh, I, um, uh, my mom never yells at my dad, and all of a sudden I hear, I hear him of her over the phone going, hang on the phone, hang on the phone to my dad, you know. And, um, so she, you know, she's like, Dave, she's like, Dave, you know, what do you want to do? You know, I said, I want to do this. You know, I, I've done everything you guys have told me to do. I've gone to college. I've gone to, you know, I've done such and such and such and such. I'm in the middle of this doctorate that you guys wanted me to do, and I'm completely miserable. Let me finally do this. So she, she, she's like, I think you need to do it. You know, I'll, I'll talk dad into it. Don't worry about him. You know? And he wouldn't talk to me for about, I mean, my dad and I, we would talk about three, four times a week. You know, just to say how we were doing. He didn't talk to me for three months after that. 
because he was so, because he, uh, my father's also uh, a Presbyterian minister here in Chicago. Uh, he's actually the pastor of one of the largest churches here. So he's giving his sermons and he's saying, my son is a doctorate student, you know, he's going to get his doctorate in Korean literature. Now he was saying things like when I was in acting school, his friends would be like, what is your son doing? He's like, he's a backup dancer for Madonna or something like that, you know, <laughs> you know really pejoratively. And I said, you know, when he said, when he would tell me those stories, I'd be like, that, that's actually a pretty good gig to be a backup dancer for Madonna, you know. Um, but yeah, that's really how it started, because I had been doing it in high school and college. And um, finally, I just decided I'm, I'm going to take a plunge here. <clears throat> so, you know, my dad's like, if you do this, I'm not going to pay for it. Blah, blah. I'm like, you haven't paid for anything since I graduated from college. I'm good. I'm good, you know. So I went, I went to New York, went to, uh, went to acting school for two years, and then really just started auditioning. And um, the Broadway gig was actually, uh, I, I, I still consider it the gift. Uh, ten months out of acting school, I got the Broadway gig actually, and um, yeah, it's just been quite a ride for since then. I think um, I'll talk a little bit about how I got into doing what I'm doing, and it's it harkens a little bit back to to David's story, and I think it also might relate to some of you. This idea that especially especially in Asian families. Asian American families, there is a very strong expectation uh, from the parents uh, of the children. And I, I was no different. I came from a family of doctors. And so there were three sons. And, um, but I always had this impulse to do art, arty things, you know. I painted and I, I loved to play the guitar and sing. And, but I knew I was supposed to become a doctor. Not only was I supposed to become a doctor, David, I had to be even more of a doctor than my brother who became a doctor. Uh, so I had to be like a brain surgeon or something like that because you always have to kind of one up. That's the expectation. Um, I went away to school and I, and I just wasn't good at science, you know. And I tried and I tried and it, it just didn't work. And I, at the same time, was always still doing my, my music, playing in bands and whatnot. Um, and finally, there's a lot of stuff that happened in between, but I, I ultimately just had to, to do what I needed to do. And um, again, like, like David, uh, my father disowned me, and he disowned me several times. And my other brother, who's a lawyer, he would uh, tell him to write, he'd say, write Philip out of the will. And so after a while, he stopped doing it. I mean, he couldn't even do it because he figured my father would come around. And, um, and then one of the things you sort of learn is that uh, ultimately my father would, could never understand why I did what I did, but he grew to accept it, which for him, given his timeline, given his history, given your own parents' history, it, it makes total sense that that is as far as he could get. Um, because as with you know, David's parents, you know, it's parent just wants the best for his children or, or her children and you know certainly the idea of going into the arts unless you have that kind of sort of history in the family it makes no sense and so um, I eventually you know began to do music I got out of college and and uh, lo and behold I couldn't make a living at it I was playing clubs and do these open mic sessions and and literally could not make a living at it and so at one point um, I made the decision to go back to law school. And so I went to law school, and um, since I couldn't play the guitar or sing, about my last year I began to write a musical. And I had, I had at that time no theater background whatsoever. I hated musicals, uh, just didn't know anything about theater, but it was something to do while I was doing law school. So, while I was clerking at a legal aid office or in lecture, I, I wrote a musical. And then before I, was, before I graduated, I had sent it off to, uh, to a few places. And um, a theater in LA called East West Players uh, called me back and said, um, Let, I, want, I want to do the musical. And I said, sure, great. And he said, uh, just uh, come on down. So what I did is as soon as I graduated, I just uh, got into my car and drove to LA from Northern California, uh, played in the band on stage, wow. 
and, and watched it. Theater. So the play did reasonably well. They asked me to write another one, so I wrote another one with less music, and that worked out, and I wrote another one with no music. And that began this journey of doing what I do now. And um, it also dovetailed a lot with my own particular developing sense of this idea of one's identity, one's color, one's race, politics of the time, um, what this thing Asian American was, how do we define it, how the arts are related to that. And so uh, that's, that's what basically I did. And, and one of the things involved in this was this idea that the world doesn't always say yes to you. And right now, it probably is saying yes. But in particular, after you step out here, you know, the world is not always going to say yes to you. There will be times when you have this particular dream, um, especially if you're interested in the arts, because there isn't sort of any kind of structure. To, and, um, and for me, you know, it was one of these very brutal lessons of playing the guitar and singing about being Asian American. This was a long time ago. Um, and the world said no to me. And, and it literally, I mean, it must have, it broke my heart. But you sort of regroup, and I said, well, I have to do something, so I went to school. <clears throat> and then while I was in law school, I wrote this musical, just because I wanted to keep myself alive. And, uh, and the world said yes to me in the form of a theater in L.A. Um, so I went to L.A., and, and I've made it a way of life. And it's allowed me to get back to all these other art forms that I was originally interested in, film and music. But it was one of those things where, you know, you, you have to both be determined and willful and also smart enough to know that there's a time when the world says no to you and it, it really means no and you have to listen and maybe go sideways and figure out something else and that'll take you perhaps uh, ultimately back to, you know, this impulse you have inside of your body. That's sort of my own particular journey. And, uh, you know, 30 years down the road, it, it's given me this, you know, wonderful um, career in life and allowed me to be, to meet all these amazing people. But still, most of my best friends are lawyers. <laughs> David? Oh, yeah, it's because it's, it's, I love the story. We were walking up to the, um, this building. And, and I, I had no idea what the names are. I'm just walking up to the building and I was like, oh my gosh, it's this place. Um, my first gig out of acting school was this, uh, uh, was this children's musical called Good Driving Amelia Bedelia. <laughs> I know, it sounds more to them. Um, and um, I, it, I played a warthog in it. And um, you know, since my parents live in Glenview here, you know, my dad, you good, I'm good, we can have lunch or dinner, you know, but I'm good. They're like, no, no, we want to come see you. We want to see why you left or what you left <laughs> after it for. I still remember the songs. It was like, good driving, Amelia, Bedelia, and I'm snorting, you know. I have a warthog thing on my face, you know, and all I'm thinking it. It, it was like, I was telling them the story that um, we actually did two shows in the Chicago land area, one actually in the city and one up here in Evanston. And um, I was a high school English teacher actually before um, I got into acting as a profession. And um, I was performing um, in front of a group of uh, schools down in Chicago. At, at the end of the show, this woman comes up to me and she goes, Mr. Ree, do you remember me? And I looked at her and I totally recognized her. I had her as a sophomore in my English class when I was teaching at Nature High School. And I was like, Carol, how you doing? She pauses for a second, she goes, what are you doing up there? <laughs> and I said to her, I was like, living the dream. <laughs> so, you know, it's like after, after the show, um, my parents came up to me and they're like, you know, what can they say? You know, I'm a warthog. They're like, they're like <laughs> instead of, they didn't even mention the show. It was all the, I'm like, I just did the show. What is great? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, it's a lot of what you were saying. Because it's interesting with my father. Um, you know, it, it's it's it, you know I, I've I've always um, no matter how old I get, uh, it's something about my father. I want that Billy Elliot moment. You know what I'm talking about? You know, at the end when he he does this grand jeté and all of a sudden he's like, oh, one dinner. You know what I mean? I want that with my dad. You know, so I was telling them the story of how um, 
you know, after, after three months, my father finally came around. You know, he started talking to me, and it, it was never about the acting. It was never about, it was more, are you sleeping well, you know? It, you should have seen him, it, like, um, when he wasn't speaking to me, my mom would always speak for him. Um, after after um, I told him that I was going to go to New York for acting school, my mom is crying on the phone the next day. I'm like, what's wrong? She goes, Dad said after you move to New York, you're going to become a drug addict. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, Dad thinks that everyone in New York can just do drugs and drink all the time. You know? And I'm like, oh, Lord, Lord, get him on the phone. Like, he doesn't want to talk to you. So, you know, he had come around, you know. He had come around, and, uh, you know, the whole time it was like, how are you eating? Are you sleeping? You know, how, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And from time to time, how's acting school? How's acting going? And it was more just sort of, um, I don't want to say patronizing, but it was, it, 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 he didn't care about that as much. It was sort of like what you were explaining, the whole idea. He could come as far as he could, you know. And really it was because uh, he, he, it wasn't about the talent that he was worried about. It was, you're a short Asian male. How many roles for you are actually out? You know, and it was just the worry of, are you going to be able to make a living doing this? And that's what he was worried about. And um, I remember, um, you know, when I got the Broadway gig, you know, I thought, Billy Elliot, move aside, David Rhee is here, you know, that's kind of idea. And um, so, I, you know, I was telling them how I bought them a plane ticket to come to New York. My dad had never come to New York before. Um, I bought, you know, I had a limousine, picked them up. You should have seen them, like, we were in a limousine. My parents have never been in a limousine. And you know, I was like, do you want water? Like, don't touch it! It's probably extra! <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I got them this huge, you know, hotels in New York are very small, but I got them this huge suite at the Hilton, you know. And I was like, I'm going to do it all for my parents, you know. And, um, and I got them the tickets for the show. That was the most nerve-wracking show I've ever done. You know, I was like, yeah, I don't care who comes, but when it's my parents, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're here, you know. At the end of the show, you know, I'm, I'm expecting again that Billy Elliot moment. So I go to my dad, I'm like, Dad, what did you think? And he looks at me and he goes, you overact. <gasps> yeah, 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 I know, I know. And my next response was, so you're leaving tomorrow, right? <laughs> you know? We were talking about how it was his way, it was the Korean male way of saying, I'm proud of you. You know, and it took two, three days for me to actually process that because initially when that happened, I was like, oh, okay. Well, you're leaving tomorrow. Good. Um, I'll have a taxi to take you guys there. You know what I mean? Take them to the airport. But really, it took about two, three days for me to process that idea of that's his way of saying I'm proud of you. You know, but he can't say I'm proud of you because he's this, you know, he's a Korean male. He went to the Marines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He's this tough guy. You know, so you know, I'm able to express emotions like that. So it's interesting that even at my, in, even now. Um, you know, my mom, of course, my mom's going to be oh, you know, all excited and everything, but it's always my dad that that, that need for, I, I guess a dark underlying thing. Like when I did M. Butterfly, you know, as you guys know, if you guys read it, um, there's that one scene at the end where I'm just completely naked, you know, and um, all I was thinking was, oh my god, how am I going to bring this to my parents, you know? <laughs> I don't want my mom and dad to see me naked on stage. Everyone else, I don't care, you know, well, mom and dad, you know? Um, so it, it was it was it was actually really fortunate because my mom found out I was going to play a woman, and she she you know she she was really nervous when she was breaching the topic with me. We were at dinner, and she goes, "It's about seventy eight percent of the play, and then I become a man at the end." She thinks for a second. She goes, "Would you mind if we skip this one? Because I don't want to see my son as a woman." And I was like, "I'm fine. I'm good with that." <laughs> you know what I mean? So my dad's going to be the reason for my dad to say, you're leaving acting now. No more. How, you know, how can you do this? You know what I mean? And it was always that, you know, it was my dad's voice of, what's my dad going to think? So it's, it's interesting. It's that constant, you know, in the back of my head. You know, one of the things, as I listened to, uh, to David talk, was this idea of um, specificity, of specificity of people's journeys. And in this particular instance, within the context of you know, your classes, the idea of you know, Asian America, what is Asian America? Does it in fact encompass enough? Is it too small? Is it specific enough? And, and one of the things that's always kind of propelled me was both my 
personal journey, but also this idea that how you have your relationships in your family, how you have yourself as you move through the world, and then the idea again of, you know, if you're Korean American, if you're first, second, or third generation Korean American, or if you're mixed race, if you're South Asian, uh, what class, uh, if there was a mix, uh, the degree to which uh, the racism was existent when, when your parents or you came over into America, if you arrived at a big urban city, East Coast, West Coast, all of those things to me are, are, are very important as I, I write something. That it all has to be taken into consideration uh, to give the piece its truth. And, um, and that's one of the, you know, to me the idea that what's changed is the idea over the years in terms of the imagery of, of Asians is that uh, because of things like Asian American studies, the, the academic scholars, um, the kind of emergence of this whole idea that there exists perhaps a framework to look at our lives. Um, it's, it is, it's afforded me a chance to really begin to think how we're very complicated and two, that we can self-define. That I can open my mouth and, and describe and talk about a world that I've always known is real, I've always known is an American story, I've always known is part of the world, uh, and that it's good, and it's fine, and that's the way it should be, as opposed to you know, looking elsewhere to sort of understand who I am you know, it, it afforded me the chance to begin to say it, the, it all begins, the story begins inside of me and then moves outward. And to me, it's that kind of perspective that allows works to not be cliche, stereotypic. And, and whether the character is good, bad, or ugly, see, I'm not concerned about that as opposed to if the character is truthful, then I'm, I'm comfortable with it. And um, One of the wonderful things now is um, as you know, more Asians get involved in the arts, a variety of Asians with different backgrounds, you know, you can have a show like Lost and have characters that are reasonably, you know, <laughs> truthful. There are wonderful actors who've been around a while, like uh, Yoon Jin Kim and uh, what's the guy's name? Daniel, 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 Kim, 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 Daniel Kim. Both have been, you know, around the scene for a while. In fact. I know I've auditioned Daniel before, and uh, and Yunjin was in a play of mine. You know, um, she used to be in UC Berkeley, and then she uh, uh, cast her in a play we did up in Seattle, which again is sort of interesting in that I had written uh, a Japanese American play, and it was about a young woman coming of age in Kauai, based on my aunt. But when Yunjin played the role, you know, there was the way she she attacked the role. That, that wasn't quite right. And I kept saying, this, the nuance is, is not right. You know, it's sort of like, you know, this, you know, Yunjin, you have to play us this kind of this way. It's not quite so immediate. You know, it's much more kind of uh, indirect. And what was interesting is, uh, what I began to realize was, this was an Asian American performance. This was an Asian American production where I've written a piece that I know the specifics of it in terms of the real specificity of it. But we're also in a time when you can have a Korean American playing a role that's Japanese American, a biracial person playing a, a you know, a, what's the opposite, biracial, monoracial person. And the understanding, at least my feeling about it, it's big enough now. There's a wealth of information that we've, be, we've begun to sort of know that there's a foundation on which to build and build other things. And so, I, I finally got it when I, I saw Yunjin act. I thought, you know what? She's a Korean American actress uh, who has a lot of that psychology history still in her body, and so she can play play it the way she interprets the role, and I sort of see it. But it's not quite the same thing as if she played it alone, or if it was played exactly the way that I heard it and saw it in my head. And that was okay. It was an Asian American. A knowledgeable one. In other words, it's not muddy. It's rather very. You know, so 
interpretation that is, is that as is we are that as is how we move through life, how we live our lives. You know, it's not a clearly defined thing, and yet you're very conscious of all the elements that go into it. And so the production was, I understood, this is an Asian American production of this Japanese American story, and it was good. Uh, and so I just. Uh, <coughs> As David, you talk, I begin to think about the specificity of how you talk about your life, your familial sort of relationship, and how there are sort of things that, even though Asian American is a fictional term, there are things that you know seem to be similar in terms of certainly parental expectation, and, uh, and how I'm sure most of you are dealing with that, especially if you're in school now, with this idea of parental expectation as to you know what you're supposed to do, as to who you are, and depending on your, your parent, you know, it can be very unspoken as it was in my family, or very overt. Um, and it's something that, you know, every person has to contend with as as he or she moves through life, this idea that you know, it's just there's a saying, it's kind of a cool saying. The face and hands the face and hands you carry when you live at home, from the time you're born and all the time you live at home, are the face and hands of your parents. But the moment you leave the house and begin your own life, the face and hands are yours. And it's almost as if, you know, you're at a point now where you're beginning to make your body. You present this face, these hands are yours. And it's always a kind of a, a difficult thing Maybe some of you know, know exactly what you're going to do, and you'll live that, and you'll never question it. Others may find that you have an impulse. It's, for some of you, it'll be really clear. Other people, it'll be sort of a, an impulse, but I don't know what to do with it. And during the course of your life, during the course of this week, during the course of this next year, you have to sort of come to grips with that sort of internal impulse and how you're going to allow it to be a part of your life or how you're going to negotiate it because we all carry within us sort of these, these impulses and, and a career is a very rigid kind of definition of, of how those impulses are supposed to fit into them and you know I think this is a, a wonderful, wonderful time and a scary time because a time when you're feeling that, you know, you're creating your hands and your face. And you're listening to <clears throat> your old hands and face. And, uh, and it's, you know, you're inventing yourselves. Uh, and being Asian American, taking the Asian American Studies course, is all part of it. <laughs> you know, it's interesting what you're saying about uh, um, uh, uh, how she came to the role with all her baggage, basically. You know, I remember. Uh, I would call it back. Well, you know, you know. Yeah. I don't mean in the negative connotation yeah. whatsoever. Uh, but it, it, you know, I'm just thinking about M. Butterfly, for example. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just. I, I mean, come, well, as a Korean, as an American, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, bring all that to that role specifically was. It was probably the uh, hardest role I've ever read, frankly, and, and ever done because uh, it was exactly that all that stuff that you're talking about. You know, and the thing too is, as you approach the role from when David, you know, reads background, the the playwright himself has come from this very interesting background where his parents are ethnic Chinese. His mother is ethnic Chinese from the Philippines, you know, and then his father is Chinese, and it's a he comes from a very strict kind of religious, you know, uh, speaking in tongues, you know, family, uh, and then he's. He's gone to these schools. Some of them have been very white uh, schools. And then, so he writes this play uh, that uh, is from his worldview and also his study, his kind of understanding of the politics of the time that he's interested in. And then David comes to the role and he's to it. And to me, that's sort of the kind of the beauty of when you see something on stage that you may not be aware of, but it's carrying all of that within it, you know, as all of that is sort of happening there. And to me, that is sort of 
an Asian American art film when that's happening. It's filled with all these very specific truths that come from the performer, the writer, uh, and the audience watching the work and interpreting it. Uh, that, that moment is sort of, I think it sounds so grandiose, transformative, but it's a moment of great, a great deal of information being given and received, and a great deal of emotional sort of sections of the body of an audience being able to sort of open up for a moment and, and feel, feel this world. And perhaps that doesn't solve, you know, solve the, uh, the crisis in the Middle East or uh, uh, unemployment, but it's important to the world. That's why art's important, because it allows us, I think, to stay fully human. Uh, and it's also difficult sometimes to explain that to people as to the importance of, of what David does, what I do, and uh, what happens on, in arts, you know, and why it's so important. I've always felt that, you know, that you have writers who are, for want of a better term now, you know, Asian Americans who write literature, poetry, make films, uh, music, theater, act, all of that to me is, is so important to uh, how, this, how America evolves. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a question, maybe uh, directly to Philip, but maybe David, you can address it too. Um, Phil, first of all, I'm really intrigued with this talk. It's great that you guys are here to share uh, your histories with us. I was interested in the whole idea of Asian American theater. When did you, Philip, decide that what you were doing was Asian American theater? Did you even have that interest at first, or did you just want to do theater? And when did you decide that what you were maybe destined to do was theater, where most of the characters were Asian, or the themes were Asian American? When did you come to that kind of realization? Well, I, I know for myself, I'm old enough that I was actually there when Asian America became a reality. In other words, before 1968, that word didn't even exist. And it was coined by a UCLA professor, uh, Yuji Ichioka. And so for me, um, just as I was leaving home to begin to, and I had my parents' face and hands, solidly <laughs> embedded into my body. Um, as I was leaving home and went to school, it was just at the midst of sort of the height of the Vietnam War, and, you know, anti-war movement. Uh, black Americans were sort of beginning to dovetail into this whole, uh, Luther King was assassinated, Robert Kennedy was assassinated, but it was at that time, not just kind of poor people, people, but, uh, this whole idea of being an Asian American was emerging. You know, literature was being written, San Francisco State, UCLA, you know, NYU, they were beginning to, the student intellectuals were beginning to develop this idea. Uh, and it was a third world idea, you know, you had uh, blacks, Chicanos, and Asians. And then also at the same time, the women's movement was starting uh, emerging at the same time. And, uh, And I was at school, and, and initially, I'd always wanted to write and do with the arts. But this might be hard for you to believe, but when I first started doing what I did, you know, when I wrote, a, I did this, or my character, central character, did this, uh, central character of a, of a novel, of a film, of a poem, of whatever, was supposed to be a white male. I mean, this is like really probably hard for you to understand, but. Literally, when I first started doing some things, my mother would say to me, like, who cares about you know, being an Asian? It should be a white person. And my mother was a very smart, intelligent woman. But the idea at that time was you couldn't yet say I and have this face, have your face. You know, a central character couldn't look like you, sound like you, have your history. And so as the movement sort of evolved, um, I also went to Japan for a while, which is a whole other story. Uh, came back, but what I discovered is I was able, for, for whatever reason, I had these impulses, and they happened to dovetail with 
an emergence of this movement that, that allowed me finally to contextualize how I saw America. And prior to that, I had no way of understanding why the space didn't work, you know, why this body didn't work, why within my own community and my family it was fine, but outside of that, everything was always, uh, was always had a dislocation. And at that time, since Asian America didn't exist, I had no way of understanding that. But as the sort of intellectual movement happened, I was able to fit into that, and, and I experienced um, a tremendous freedom. It was, it was an epiphany. You know, this idea that I can actually write, play, write a song, and the central character can look like me, and and sort of discuss what matters to me and move through the world and that it was an American story. Um, and at that point, you know, I, I got involved, I, I was sort of the second wave of sort of theater and the arts. You know, the first wave, I think, in terms of theater would be more like Frank Chin. Uh, and I sort of came in, started working in San Francisco and Frank had just had a fight with my friend and was quitting the theater and I sort of started working with him. Around 1980, um, but it'll, what I'm saying basically is I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, you know, where you sort of you dovetail with a social movement, and it sweeps you along, and you go along with it, and sort of in your actions uh, both help to define it, and it helps to define you. And so that's when I knew, you know, that I was doing this thing called Asian American theater. Uh, I remember at one point, you know, David Huang and myself, we both started about the same time. Uh, we were doing something, I forget what, we were looking at each other, and there were a couple other people, actors, and I think we were joking, you were saying, wouldn't it be weird one day if people actually studied this stuff? <laughs> and, you know, this, that's, yeah, and it would have never seemed possible that, that it would ever reach sort of this, this phase, but that's how I knew, you know, that I was doing Asian American theater and what it afforded me at that moment. Um, and there are also you know, groups that uh, bring them to the fore and make their voices uh, have a, uh, an, an elegant uh, need to be. You know, one of the things I feel is that in art, what, everything we're doing, you know, I, I feel like you shouldn't write, you shouldn't do any, say anything if you don't have anything to say. And, uh, and I read a lot of works about a lot of things. And my feeling is, you know, if you don't have anything to say, shut up. <laughs> and that art, Asian American art in particular, you know, emerged because there was this need, this need to sort of get something out. And so a lot of the earlier works were Japanese American, Chinese work, you know, some Korean American, some Filipino American. And it had to do with sort of uh, the internment camps, racism, Angel Island, immigration sort of patterns. But, you know, for example, with my Korean American friends, you know, this idea of the alley riots, you know, Saigu, it provided this one moment for, you know, all the Korean Americans to suddenly have this need to say something. And so there was a burst of like literature, film, you know, books. And, and it's interesting how uh, in the past 15 years, you know, there's been an emergence in terms of Filipino American work, uh, Korean American work. Uh, and what's happening right now is very interesting. It, it has, it relates to this whole idea of the Silk Rose Theater Project, where I just uh, helped moderate a panel at the first Middle Eastern American theater conference. And uh, I was invited to, to moderate. But it's part of this idea as to, again, what does the umbrella encompass in terms of what is Asian American? South Asian, uh, Middle Eastern American. And what's sort of fascinating about what Silk Road Theater Project is doing is, you know, when they, when they told me this idea, I thought, this is the smartest idea I've ever heard of. 
you know, this idea that they were going to make as their through line, their through line include in terms of their company, um, the Silk Road. And so anybody that sort of was connected with the Silk Road uh, would be part of their intellectual and aesthetic narrative. And it makes a lot of sense because when you travel, you're sharing food, you're sharing genes, you're screwing together, eating together, everything sort of like being sort of shared. So if you think about it, it's actually a very interesting model. Uh, and as opposed to this other Asian American one where historically, you know, everybody hates the Japanese, so, uh, and rightfully so. Um, <laughs> and we can laugh about that now because again, it's part of this different sort of like context to look at, but uh, yeah. I kind of lost my way there. It's sort of like... Could I redirect the question to David? I mean, what was your point of entry into Asian American theater, and how do you approach it differently than if you're doing a non-Asian American production? I know even as, as an actor, you're supposed to kind of be as flexible as possible. Right, do you right. see that at all? You know, it's, it's, um, I'm at the tail end. It's basically everything you and your contemporaries have set up. I have set the ground before I'm able to sort of you know, be a part of that, you know, that I don't have to, that idea of um, having the sense of character be an Asian American is, it's as normal as uh, you know, a white character, frankly. I remember uh, I was doing a show with Leslie Uggams. Um, Leslie Uggams, she's a Broadway actor. Uh, she's been on television, movies, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, she and I were doing a show together. We were talking about this issue of this dash American, you know, African American, Asian American. And um, I asked her how she started in the business. And one of the things, you know, she, she's a tapper. She, I mean, she's a triple threat through and through. And she, I said, you know, what, is, what, what do you feel is the difference between you as an African-American actor and the white actors out there? And she said, specifically, every time a white actor acts, they could just act. Every time I act, I have a, I'm holding up a sign saying, I am an African-American. I, I, I'm on the front lines of this almost like battle, which is what she said. And she's like, Dave, every time you go out there, because you're a minority, um, when you're on stage, when you're doing whatever as an actor, you're carrying the, you know, this thing that says, I am a minority, I am, you know, I represent this, you know? And I looked at her and I said, God, I just want to act, you know? And she's like, of course you do, but because you're a minority in this specific country, you're always on the front lines of this battle, is what she said. And that actually made me angry, because I was thinking, you know, God, it, uh, frankly, if I could do Shakespeare for the rest of my life, you know, I would do it. But you can't make a living doing Shakespeare, you know. So you have to do musicals, you have to do, you know, television, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's. But what I noticed, especially when I came to Chicago, is that everyone kept saying to me, "Oh, do you know about the Silk Road Theater Pro uh, Company? Do you know about the Silk Road?" I would audition for the Goodman, and after that, they would talk to me like, "Do you know about the Silk Road Theater uh, Project?" And I, well, one of the things I noticed was, you know, here I was. It's exactly what you uh, initially stated: this whole idea of being flexible. And here I, I want to do Shakespeare. I want to do et cetera, et cetera. And also, it's it's almost being placed in there without, you know. It, this was the first year, I remember saying this to a friend of mine, I felt, you know, um, you know when I was younger, you know, I remember, I remember thinking, this is, I can't do anything. And it's not because I can't do it, because limitations have been placed on me, which is very, and it's the first year that I've actually felt it, and I don't know if it's because I'm in Chicago, because I've never felt it in New York, but it, it was, it was sort of like being at Steppenwolf and them saying, here's your place, the Silk Road Theater Project being at the Goodman and them saying, here's your place, you know what I mean? So in a way, it, was, um, it wasn't a conscientious decision. I, you know, I am Asian, I am American. It was almost like, oh, you're Asian, you're living in America, here's your place, you know what I mean? So it's almost being placed in there instead. Um, one of the professors at Columbia University in New York, he and I were uh, speaking about, uh, I, I'm interested in the whole MFA process, the Masters of Fine Arts, and you know, I was auditioning for him, he looks at me at the end, he goes, why do you want an MFA, you know? And I, and I was like, you know, um, I can make a lot of money doing the stereotypical Asian, you know, putting on my buck teeth, putting on the slanted eyes, and my, ah, oh, hello, how are you, you know? I can make a lot of money doing that, you know? And it's, it's really a conscious decision that, that I think every Asian American actor has to make. Do you do that and make a lot of money, or do you choose to be an artist and struggle? You know, 
And it's, it's and there's and, and really no judgment on the people who have chosen the path to make a lot of money because you gotta eat you gotta eat you know at the end of the day. But it's just interesting that when you choose not to take that path, um, how people you know as much as you struggle against it, how people sort of place you into that mold. As much as you try to you know it's like look, um, you probably, the guy who played the key master in Matrix. He, he set up his own uh, theater company in Wisconsin. Oh, Randall Duck Kim? Randall, Randall. Uh, Randall Duck Kim in the Asian American com uh, community for the actors, he is God. You know, he's like, ah, you know what I mean? Um, he, he, I mean he's, he's fucking fierce. You know, he's just like, he, he's, he's, I don't know how old he is at this point, but he yeah. takes off his shirt and he's cut his head. You know, <laughs> mid to late 60s. And he's just he's just like this like you know he he can do anything and he went out to Hollywood and Hollywood you know um, at that time there in and, and you know all these people. and he actually said no I'm not going to be that I want to do classical theater I want to do so he moved to Wisconsin to set up this theater company that now is considered one of the premier theater companies in America for classical theater but that's a sacrifice. Asian American actors have to make that a lot of white actors don't have to make, which is, I mean, come on, you have to move, if you're from Wisconsin, no offense, but you have to move to Wisconsin. You have, you know, you have to do that whole thing, whereas, you know, for, uh, for the actors who are uh, not of color, they, these aren't choices, these aren't decisions that they have to struggle with. You know, they, they're, not, they're not placed into this, oh, you're a white actor, it's, oh, you're an actor, boom, this is all for you. For me, when they see me, oh, you're an Asian actor. This is what you're allowed to do. It's interesting that uh, I mean, sh Chicago has been very good to me, but I've, it, um, in the conclusion of you know, I have my limitations. Um, ever since I've come to Chicago, these shows that I've done, I mean, I, I've been getting calls. Chicago has been great in that, and this is an actor's dream where the theater calls you and says, "We'd like to offer you this role, and you don't even have an audition for it," you know. Um, but they're always the Asian role. You know, they're always, and I was like, you know, I can do this role too. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 but we have someone for that, we like you for this specific role. You know, so every single one of my, and, and, and don't get me wrong, some of the roles have been, and, and Butterfly, you know, coming back to that, uh, and uh, uh, Seven Wolf did a production called Kafka on the Shore. You did the play? I did, yeah, I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another copy there. For a copy, sure, sure. Um, that was just phenomenal to be a part of, but it's just interesting that it's, oh, it, you know, as much as I want, you know, it's like, I'd like to do this. Oh, that's great. Here, here's the Asian role. You know what I mean? So it's interesting that this whole idea of Asian American, um, it, I feel like in a way, um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not separated from the idea or the concept of Asian Americanness, but it's interesting that people keep placing me in that definition. They keep defining it for me, if that makes any sense, you know? Um, First, or, um, Philip, I want to say thank you for speaking to the um, to the point of being culturally specific. And one of my mentors was Shetty Moraga, who sort of writes against universal universality, right? Yeah, so sure. when you work yeah. in a Eurocentric paradigm, which many theater departments and drama departments have worked within that framework, that it is about writing outside of universality, saying like, no, this this is a this is a this is a Korean American play, this is an African American play, this is a Chicano play, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm going to honor that cultural, you know, specificity. So I wanted, I wanted to say thank you for, for speaking to that. But sort of a, a, a question for the both of you, um, just real general questions. Sort of who, who are your, who are your mentors? Who are your inspirations in terms of writers or performers, musicians? And just sort of want to open it up. Okay. <laughs> Um, for me, I guess the idea again was when I started doing this, there were there were no sort of uh, people to look up intellectual uh, awakening or, or understanding that ultimately was my my muse or inspiration. It was the the ideas that were given to me that allowed me to understand how I fit into the world, and that was what propelled me. And it was a continual process. Again, this is sort of one of those fortunate things where 
it was a continual process of me sort of just literally testing the world uh, as to what the work should be. Uh, so it was kind of like being my own sort of teacher uh, to sort of be inspired to do what I did. Uh, I would have loved to have had a mentor, uh, but that just wasn't the case. It's just not the case now. Um, so that certainly was the case for me. Okay. Uh, a show in New York. Um, we were doing a talk back and where the question was exactly that, who are your mentor? You know, we were, you know, all of us were sitting on the stage and we were going to the line, you know, Bernadette Peters, you know, just blah, blah, blah. It was my turn. I was like, who am I going to say? And I, and I just like, when it was my turn, I said, Bono. You know, from <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Because, it's but that's fine. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. But you know what, I think it's, it's interesting that, because um, I grew up in the Midwest and this, it was very much, um, I, I remember reading Cheng Ray Lee's Native Speaker and, um, it was the first Korean American novel that I, and not, not the first Korean American novel, but it was a, uh, one that I, it was a novel that I read that was uh, you know, my contemporary, I should say, that after I read it, I was like, oh my god, I've been missing this. Meaning, like, you know, reading Catching the Rye, for example, um, you know, all the students who can just relate to that character, you know, I was once removed, you know, or reading whatever novel, and all of a sudden I'm reading Cheng Wei Li's novel, and I was just like, oh my god, I can connect with this. This is what, this visceral response to a novel, this is what I've been missing my whole life, you know? And um, I just, it, it's sort of like what you said, that emotional and intellectual connection. I don't think there really was anyone. Growing up in the Midwest, I didn't know Philip, I didn't know David Henry Wong, you know? They were coast people, you know what I mean? So that whole idea of, you know, AB stereotypes, we were, you know, my brother and I would always be like, you know, we'd be making fun of him just as much as the white actors, the white uh, uh, audience was, you know what I mean? So, really, there was no one to look up to. It was just one of those things. I, I remember one time watching Leonardo DiCaprio of all people, you know, when he was younger, just watching him on screen and thinking, I can do that. You know, I can do that. Put an Asian face on that, just as interesting, <laughs> you know? So the great, I mean, the great I can even tell you what that was. Yeah. And I, just, I, and I just remember thinking, so, you know, if anything, I think, um, I mean, I idolized. When I was in college, um, I was just telling a friend of mine, uh, one of the things that I did my last uh, semester in college, um, I had finished all my courses, so, you know, last semester I was taking basketball, volleyball, you know, just all the BS courses that I could take. And I was done by 12 o'clock in the afternoon. I would eat lunch, go to the library, and I would watch all these movies that I had read about. I became so enamored by Marlon Brando. You know, he was just, I mean, he, I remember a friend of mine who was a, um, was a professor, um, he was a professor at UCLA, um, for film studies. And he said, Marlon Brando, when you see him shirtless in A Street Kind of Desire, it makes a straight man question his own sexuality. <laughs> just when he, you know? But it was just interesting, you know, just reading up about his process, about his technique and everything, that everything that he was doing, there was thought behind, you know? And that started intriguing me, this idea of uh, the process of acting, the process of acting as an art form, not, you know, versus being a star, you know what I mean? So if there was anyone, I would say it was, you know, it sounds kind of cliche, but the Marlon Brandos, and James Dean, they're just, God, they're so cool. And part of it was, I, I think also, it was something I knew I could never be. Just because I'm Asian, that's it. You know what I mean? So I was like, I, it, uh, part of me was like, fuck you, I can't be that. You know what I mean? So. No, I, I just was reminded, you know, one writer whom I have a great deal of respect for and have, I go back to and study his works, is August Wilson. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I literally would go back to, one play in particular, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. You know, it's one of those things where it's such a good play that I, I just read it to remind myself why I do what I do. You know, because what he does, he does so well. And, um, I also remember that the first play I ever read that I understood, because I couldn't read plays before, they made no sense to me, was a play by this writer named Sam Shepard, who in the 60s was a very big thing. Um, and I read his, one of his plays, and I thought, this. This makes sense to my body. You know, it's nothing about being Asian American, but it makes sense to my body, whatever he's doing in terms of the language and the structure. And uh, a couple of years later, <laughs> I, I encountered him in, uh, in sort of this group. And I was thinking, I feel like this is Shepard. You know, 
I think of somebody you really admire, and you're kind of going, wow, this is such a And so uh, uh, he got up, and then uh, he went to the bathroom. <laughs> and, I, and I followed him in. <laughs> and so, you know, I got, this, I got next to the stall next to him. <laughs> and I was like, I, got, I have to talk to her. <laughs> You know Sam, <laughs> and uh, he, he actually didn't talk to me then. <laughs> he mumbled a bit and then walked away. Uh, but there's you know, the lesson in that is, of course, you know, be careful about whom you pick as sort of your your because Toto, what's most right for you, because um, he's a very good writer. But you know, ultimately, he's this uh, white kid from Duarte who thinks he's a cowboy. You know. Uh, and writes very good male characters and not so good female characters. But just really made me think something sort of interesting too with just um, Marlon Brando and the idea with uh, Tennessee Williams. You know, his work is all basically, I, you know, it's been, it's been theorized. It's, it's closeted, you know, everything, he's a gay man who's closeted, so as a consequence, all his characters ultimately are, are impelled by that sort of uh, stricture, as it were. Um, just real quickly, let me think of a couple things. I mean, this idea of um, the audience watching a play it, and how it changes the work on stage and how an actor can also feel it. But um, if you go see an August Wilson play and let's say the audience is 90% uh, white and other and 10% black and you sit there, I sit there, I'll have one experience of the play. If you see the play with 50% black and 50% other, your experience of that play will be totally different. Again, it's because you'll be a part of this world that is getting the work of all cylinders. And theater is this alive, unspoken medium at times that an actor can feel it. And in the audience, you literally, you're sort of feeling it with them. And it's a very, very different experience. Um, and this gets back to this idea you were talking a bit about being in a box. And what do you choose, how do you choose to approach that idea? Um, I was doing a play in Boston. And it was a play about this Japanese American family uh, after the internment camps. They're, you know, they're living out on this farm in Stockton. And I think it's a very passionate play. I think there's blood all over the stage. Q&A. Uh, and in Boston, you know, it's, it's it's a, you know, I think it's sort of an intellectual studio town, but, you know, someone raised his hand and said, you know, Mr. Gatanda, I'm Jewish, and in my family, if that had happened, there'd be blood all over the stage. They'd be yelling and screaming and talking to each other, you know, and really going at it, and there's nothing happening in your boy. And um, I was sort of flabbergasted, but it reminded me again of this idea of depending on your particular background, what you see on stage sometimes is opaque. You know, that he in fact was not able to read any of the cues that were going on, any of the subtext, and he's a very bright, obviously smart man. And that again, you know, it's almost like the audience has to bring something to the work that allows the work also to open up, and that I, I just decided a long time ago that I'm, I'm writing to the truth of my world, and that I can't, that the world has changed so much in the last 10, 15 years in terms of the, the images of Asians. It's also become sort of very fluid in terms of, you know, international. What is American? What is, what is Asian? It's becoming very fluid. Um, you know, I teach at times, and I don't know about you kids, but, you know, my class is, my Asian American courses, you know, people, spend their school year here, but they, they in the summer back in Thailand or Southeast Asia and they come back here for school. They're bilingual, tricultural, you know, they are comfortable in, in several cultures. They're, my nephews are interested in Chinese pop stars, you know, a South Asian friend likes manga, anime, and it's, it's such an interesting kind of world where you know, in terms of like imagery of what is a, a male, Asian male, is he sexualized? Is he, you know, it, it all becomes changed when, and more when you have all these Asian films that are coming in. 
that are, you know, and various male heroes coming in, and it sort of gets fluid again, kind of all mixed in as to what is a, uh, a male sort of image. Is the Asian male, you know, kind of not masculine? I think all those arguments are, are really almost over because so much has been changing. Um, it's also interesting too is like what you consider beauty, what you consider appealing. <clears throat> uh, two stories for that really quickly. But it has to do again with, with imagery and how you respond to it as with your body. I was in Japan and uh, I first got to Japan and there was a picture, I went to a noodle shop and there was a picture of, black and white picture of a classic Japanese beauty. <clears throat> And I looked at it and I said, man, that's a man in drag. Um, a year later, I come back to the same noodle shop and I look at that woman and I get it. I understand her beauty. <clears throat> and it's again because you've lived in the world and you sort of have been able to sort of understand what is beauty. And certainly, I mean, all of you realize that to what degree, you know, it's all of your standards of what is beauty, what is masculine. They're all sort of like, you know, represented, your conditions, you buy into them. But what's sort of interesting is, and I've noticed this, and now I don't notice it, is that in terms of the Western sort of uh, good-looking, I'll say males, for example, there's, there's sort of a new look now. It's a biracial look. Where when it first appeared, you know, because I'm so Asian-centric, I always, oh, that, that person's Asian, what now? But now the idea of like Keanu Reeves, he's simply good looking. But 20 years ago, he would be ethnic, really ethnic. The Tilly sisters, all these things, it's sort of like, it's sort of how we look at beauty in the world, what's masculine has, has been changing. And, and you know, if you look at some of sometimes the kind of signature sort of people out there, you can kind of sense to get a feel for uh, how the the world is changing and how the images are changing. I've noticed this thing watching television recently. My wife and I were looking at the television. Every, they have like black and white couples, uh, but it, everything's sort of mixed and, and all the people of color are sort of not definite. And, and it's sort of this interesting world where, of course, it's dictated by uh, the, the market. But that again, this kind of world is, and it's, it's I think it's kind of nice. It's all kind of, you know, kind of, kind of morphing together. It's just, you know, just variety of things. Media is, you know, Asian America is a live and a live beast. Whether you choose to think that it's outdated, it needs to be thrown away. The world that it tries to encompass is very much alive and, um, and will continue to sort of move forward. Uh, but it just will change. It just keeps changing in terms of how much it encompasses the geography, the history, and and for example, for myself, I've you know I've been working a lot with Asian communities in relationship to other communities. So a lot of uh, Asian African American stuff, uh, but also the idea again of the Middle East. You know, I've been very interested in sort of this very interesting phenomena. Uh, a writer, woman writer, wrote about it in Egypt, and there's this whole movement called the. the Piety, politics of piety is the name of the book, but it's this pietist movement. And how in Egypt, uh, this woman went there, she's a uh, Palestinian American, no, she's, yes, I think so, but she's a professor at UC Berkeley, and she went there to study these women in Egypt who are like middle class, uh, Western educated women who are converting back to a very traditional lifestyle. And she went basically as very much a Western feminist. You know, that was her sort of point of view. But as she stayed there for a while, she began to look at these women. And these are women who used to wear high heels, you know, uh, skirts, the latest fashions, who are, who are converting back to sort of a secular, uh, away from secularism, back into a very kind of uh, pietist, observant, uh, traditional sort of is Islamic way of life. And, it's sort of this interesting phenomenon where you would not expect that. But what I'm trying to say is I'm interested in sort of like, from where I've come from, the world keeps growing. And so taking that, my, my own familial sort of history, where Asian America started and where it continues to go, it's, it's a sort of an alive 
a live beast. I mean, since you're sexy, oh. and you're not short. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny what you're saying about this whole idea of perception, because what I was thinking when you were saying that, and I don't know if I can uh, express this, but I was just thinking about the whole idea of Asian Americanness, uh, specifically in the theater world, and how, you know, um, to define it, number one, is limiting, and also the controversy of this, um, of how people, I was doing this, and um, I spoke all my lines in, in Cantonese, and I remember having, you know, oh my God, having to learn Cantonese to Chinese people with their seven oh, tone, nice. this life. And um, I, I, when I was learning the role, I remember going down to Chinatown in New York and just saying these lines to these ladies that I would like, just like start a conversation with. You know, one of the lines was, you know, you're the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, you know. And if, if they went, oh, you know, it was like that, I was like, I said it right, you know, that kind of thing. And, um, and I wanted to get it down right, you know, because, um, and I, I just remember spending, I had my friend came who was Chinese, and I wrote it out phonetically, and I was like, okay, I am just spending hours on uh, my dialogue. And it was just interesting, afterward, uh, there were some Chinese uh, who would come up to me after the show, and they would just start speaking Chinese with me, you know, Cantonese, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not Chinese. And they're like, oh, you know, that was, I didn't care, white people, whatever, they complimented me, oh, thank you. But when a Chinese came up and said, we thought you were Chinese, I'm like, let me get by you a drink, you know what I mean? But it was interesting because that was that, but it was, there was also, because uh, to me, the role that I played, um, basically, the, uh, myself and my older brother, we just come from Hong Kong, and there's this idea that, um, uh, well, and uh, we want to bring our sick mother from Hong Kong to America, and, um, but the thing is, we, the only job that we can find is with this woman who's basically doing this slave trade. You know, all these women who are coming to New York to become actresses, we're kidnapping them and sending them as sex slaves back to Hong Kong, which actually is historically accurate. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that we were doing was that, but we were also heroic in that my specific character says, you know, I'm not a girl white with her. You know, and I think it was an incredibly heroic character. It was just interesting to see. Um, I, I had some people come up to me at the end of the show who are Asian and say things like, you know, how does it feel to sell out? And I was like, what? Well, you know? So it's just the whole idea of perception and the whole idea of so many people defining it in different ways. Um, doing it in Butterfly, going back to that show, um, I read two reviews, which I thought was really interesting. I have the main character completely naked. You know, and one of the questions that they asked was, is it to draw um, the gay population that are into Asian males to come to the show? You know, yeah, yeah, that whole, and I'm like, and it, you know, my God, if we had actually sat down and talked about that, it's like, this is going to bring them in, oh, blah, blah, you know what I mean? We're not that astute, you know? So, so just like the, the, that whole idea of, you know, just like, it, 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 all of a sudden, this, this, doing that play, all, there were so many levels of, um, you know, race, gender, sexuality, etc., etc. But it was sort of it's going back to what you said, the whole idea of perception and this whole idea of that mass audience when, you know, the whole idea of what, what, what happens when, and, 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 you know, when a, a gay population would come to see the show, you know what I mean? All of a sudden the reaction, and, you know, you were like, oh, what a great audience. And it was a gay audience, you know, after you, you would meet them, et cetera, et cetera, versus an audience that um, maybe wasn't gay, you know. And, and then, of course, well, how do you know they're gay? You know, we won't get into that. Um, but, you know, it, it was just interesting, the whole idea of perception and how our play was being perceived depending on who came to see the show. When yeah. the Asians came to see the show, you know, their perception. When the gay Asians came to see the show, their perception. When the females came to see the show, you know, it was just like... It, it was, you know, the whole idea, you know, just the whole going back to, I just want to be an actor, you know, and all of a it was just like, do, 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 you know what I mean? And I, I remember, um, I, I, one of the things, one of my favorite reviews was from the Chicago Tribune, <laughs> they go, David Reed, not exactly the prettiest woman, you know, and I was like, it's true, I would put on a serious wig every night, and I would look at myself in the mirror, and I'd be like, so ugly. It was just <laughs> and, you know, and what, no, 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 no. I'm not looking for sympathy here. I was ugly. I know. I know my face. I'm very much a man, you know, and I live in that. And I, I am. One of the things that I did during the audition was I took off my shirt because there's this moment where he that he confronts his lover and he begins to take off his shirt. We still get it. And um, and I thought after that oh, they're not going to hire me. So when they called me and they said like you put the shirt, I was like. 
okay, you know, you know what you're getting. That type of thing. And the reason why they said they actually did hire me was because I am masculine. You know, they said that your body is very masculine, and we want one of the points of view. And I think the play addresses this beautifully: is this idea of what you're saying, the sexualized male. You know, that here's the white male who's looking at me, and I'm very male. I remember friends coming to see it, and they were saying, "Look, whether or not you're good or not, I never believed that you're a female. Get male and effeminize you anyway." You know, and I remember one thing. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, to prepare for that, I, I, I take dance, I'm a dancer also, I know. I remember talking to a friend of mine in dance class, I'm like, what do I do with this role? And she goes, well, one of the things that the director tells you is like, you keep on saying more fluid, more fluid, more fluid. And he said, she goes, why don't you go into a swimming pool and just say all the lines in a swimming pool? Mm. Ding, 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 ding. So literally, for, again, hours, I would go into a swimming pool. And you just, people are swimming by me, and I see these lines. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it too, you know, but you're like, whatever, you know. So it was just, it, it was just, um, it was interesting because we never wanted it to be, we never wanted her to be effeminate. And he chose me specifically because of the masculinity uh, aspect of it. And yet, what a lot of people were writing, a lot of, you know, the, again, the idea of perception. Um, it was just interesting to talk about, they were bringing up the effeminate uh, Asian male, et cetera, et cetera, where we weren't even trying to go for that. You know, we, again, his perspective is, you are male. And yet, again, going back to what I said initially about being defined by the audience, being defined by them, saying, okay, this is what you are, this, you know, and, and when we weren't even going for that. You know. so, um Talking about uh, the perception of like what the audience perceives, and then also coming from um, what you as an actor or playwright bringing the Asian American experience <laughs> into a play. And so both of you guys have been on both sides of, of casting of, of a play. How do you feel about non-Asian, non-Asian American actors starting to come into more Asian American work or getting cast in can you kind of cite an example of that? Well, I was more specifically like the Jonathan Price and, <laughs> and oh, the Saigon. I'm actually a production of Pacific Overture in Chicago, Chicago Shakes. Yeah. Half the cast, were, yeah. oh, there was an African American in it, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest, and half the cast, they were a point of African American. Mm -hmm. background. Yeah, so there's that. And then, and then I was also thinking like, you know, as Asian American theater is maybe getting more you know, even addressing like high school theaters in, in, in theater programs, like you're not going to cast all of those characters just be like to find an agency who's welcoming the idea of an African American or a white American playing uh, a Japanese internment experience. I mean, how do you feel about it? Well, you know, it, my ideas about that have changed over the years. Um, but, um, you know, to me it has a lot to do with the intention of the people casting it. You know, I, I'm, I'm not as concerned about, I care about employment issues. I care, all my friends, I'm married to an actor. <laughs> At the same time, I'm, if I were to give priorities to the substantive uh, aspect of what is going on, you know, if, if you cast Jonathan Price, you know, I think that's coming from, if you know, Cameron McIntosh. It's a worldview that's very racist and, and very limited. He doesn't understand. He had no idea of the history behind all the pool of Asian American actors. You know, David was David Wong was right to kind of go after him, um, but it also you know, it depends on the time and and the intelligence of the people approaching it. For example, now uh, that was like what ten plus years ago, twenty maybe. Twenty. Yeah. So it's but again, it's the world's changed radically. Um, in some ways, not, but. Um, for example, um, colleges in you know in my own work with colleges, anybody plays the roles. Yeah, it's just anybody plays again. But you have to each actor has to understand the history as best as he or she can of the character. It involves information. Um, in terms of a non-Asian playing an Asian, um, again, I would say it depends. You know, at, at some point, I want 
The Wash, one of my old classic plays. In fact, I've been pushing this to be done by a non-Asian group. The reasoning is that you know, they'll reach a time when collectively we all have enough information about being Asian American so that you can do that and everyone understands that, of course, there is a real specific world there and we are doing otherwise. In other words, it reaches the, the state of being a classic. In other words, you can do it, and since there's enough information and experience out there, it's okay. As opposed to a Cameron Macintosh with very limited perspective, not being aware, casting it for his own particular reasons. Um, I've been doing this thing of, I wanted, I did a play at this theater called ACT in San Francisco. It's a very large theater. And there's a Japanese American character in the play. And I wanted to play by an African American. And the reason I wanted to do that was everything was right about the moment. It is a big mainstream theater. Uh, it's on the West Coast in San Francisco. People are fairly knowledgeable, you know, collectively as to what the Japanese American experience is. Uh, I, I wanted to have uh, Gregory Wallace, African-American actor, was a company actor. So he was part of the company and could play that role uh, because he's a company actor. Also, it was an African-American as opposed to, let's say, a Caucasian actor playing the Japanese-American character. And I thought, you know, I've, I've been interested in kind of trying to sort of kind of explode almost the reverse of before. We've moved on so that I wanted to have an African-American playing this Japanese-American role. Uh, but the theater wouldn't go for it, interestingly enough. Uh, but I thought, and it's, it's, I'm going to keep trying to do that, because I like this idea of almost saying, this is a classic world. We all understand what the history is. And two, there's enough employment there. Let us you know, try this and, and just see what the audience is going to see, especially when they know he's a company actor. Um, so it's, it's, again, it's this idea for me, I'm trying to figure out and play with these kind of various uh, themes. But it's interesting that Francis Chu had been playing with Derek. Yeah. And he was excellent. People loved him. So it's sort of like, I went, okay. I, I agree. I think it's intent. I mean, I remember being in an audition for this Witcher in New York, and uh, an African-American walked in. And I remember the Asian actors, we all looked at each other and we're like, Give us our shows. <laughs> there are very few of them. Give us our shows. But we, I, I, it wasn't, I don't think it was race specific as much as it was economic reasons. You know, we have very few shows that we can actually work and actually make a living on. Let us have those shows. You know what I mean? I think that's what it boiled down to more than you're not good enough or, you know, the whole idea of race at that moment. I think it is intent. Is there a reason for it? It's, it's um, there's something ironic. My, the school, the high school that I teach at, they're doing thoroughly modern Millie this season, this year. Yeah, and you know they've come up to me and they're like, so uh, your role that you did in New York, we have two white guys playing the two brothers. How do you feel about that? And I was like, it's New Trier. It's New Trier. Yeah, exactly. Like, the Asian students at New Trier, they basically they study. You know, they, <laughs> they don't do theater. You know. So you know, I, I, in that instance, th there's no go-to Asian actor in the school. What are you gonna do? You know, and this this kid, his name's Keegan Witzke. He's always coming up to me, and he's like, Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed, listen to listen to my listen to my Cantonese, and he'll just say like the first two words. I'm like, stop, go away, come back, come back, you know. And he's just the day he comes into my office, he's like. Listen. Even today, you didn't even say any word, and I was just like, no, no, not today. Come back tomorrow, you know what I mean? You know, and I was telling him, look, for this role, you know, I expect, you know, I, I was like, I, you know, I was just telling him, I was like, you know, I, I went to Chinatown, and when I was telling you guys, you know, I, you know, I spent hours on this. I wrote it out phonetically. Did you write it out phonetically? He's like, I don't know the phonetic alphabet. I'm like, then go learn it, you know what I mean? The L down to Exactly, I mean, come on, go to Chinatown. He's like, Chinatown? We have a Chinatown? And it's like, you have a big city. What city is it? I'm sure students, they live in this bubble. Um, so, you know, it's, well, again, you know, what am I going to say? What do I, what do I say to the director? I'm like, you, you can't do this, you know, because the two Asian roles that are played by white people, you know, they don't have people to go to, to do that, you know what I mean? So, I think that, you know, I don't think it's as simple as yes, no, as much as it is, it's intent, it's 
economic reason, mm -hmm. there's a practical reason to say there's such a number. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, do you think the right plays are to play by Asian American? You know, I think it's just going back to what I said. I would love to do whatever comes my way, but I've noticed, you know, uh, for you know, for obvious reasons, I'm placed in those roles. I'm placed in those political. You know, it's it's it's, it's what Leslie Uncom said. Every time I go on stage, it's political. Every time I go on stage, I'm in the front lines of politics, saying, "Look, I'm a minority." You know what I mean? Whether I want to or not. And um, if I if I, and all I'm thinking in the back of my head is, I just want to act. You know, so in terms, I, I, there's a part of it that feels like I've been thrust into that space um, unknowingly, if that makes sense. And then, and then, don't get me wrong, and it's also served to my advantage, frankly, because I've been able to do some amazing roles because of it, you know? So, I don't know. Forced to, kind of, or? Yeah, like it's your job to make sure that the voices of the Asian Americans are heard. No, you know, like maybe initially a little bit. But now it's, you know, I do it because it's part of what I want to say. And again, for example, the two works I'm working on right now in terms of how it is an old territory. So again, it's rather taking what I know and what I've done and what I understand and keep pushing it. Uh, one of my plays I'm doing now is about uh, Chang Yining Bunker, or Chang Yining, the original Siamese twins who uh, had this extraordinary life. They were, I call them the first Asian American superstars. Uh, they were born in 1811 in Siam, or Thailand, and were brought over uh, around 1829 to Boston to be part of a freak show, which they used to have back then, the Venus Hottentot, you know, where they'd get these exotic acts and bring them over to America and England. The thing that was, uh, they were smart businessmen. They were also, uh, Good looking. So they were conjoined twins, but they were also good looking. They were personable. And on the trip over from um, Bangkok to Boston, they picked up English, sailor's English, but they picked it up. Uh, what they did after a couple of years is they bought out their own contract. They changed their posters before they were infantilized. They looked like two little boys. They made themselves men, you know, with cutaways, handsome. Uh, and at a very young age, when they made enough money, they quit. And they retired to North Carolina <laughs> and married sisters, the eight sisters, two uh, local Caucasian sisters. And you got to think about this now. Two conjoined twins, marrying sisters, OK? And between them, they begat 21 children, some of whom served in the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. They had slaves. Uh, and, and the span of their lives, you know, it starts when there were no sort of legal, ca legal categories for what a Chinese person is, to by the time of the end of their career, Chinese are, you know, hated. And so it's sort of that the arc of their lives passes through so much. But, you know, the most extraordinary thing is they had beds that were big enough for three people. And they, they lived in two separate sort of farms. And they would spend four days here, three days there, three days here, four days there. And, and the beds are big enough for three people. <laughs> so the question is, how did they do this technically? And <laughs> just do it. And evidently, they had worked out the system where a brother could, one of them who was not involved, could disappear. Sort of, as it were, blank out. And so one of them would blank out for about three days, while the other carried on his life with his wife. Then they would go to the other place, and the, the brother who was not involved would blank out. But one wonders, you know, if, if they ever sort of unblanked at, at various moments. But, you know, that's an example of it. It, it sort of involves so many different kinds of stories. The other one I'm doing is called Love in American Times, and it's, uh, it's about that phen it's phenomenon now that's very interesting. Is, uh, I call it the Rupert Murdoch. Phenomenal. And that's where you have, uh, and this is based on, this is based on the true thing where uh, there's like a matchmaker in, in the Bay Area in San Francisco. And uh, she would set up very good looking, talented, beautiful Asian women with very, very wealthy white males. Uh, and there's something 
that works the best. Now, if you think about Rupert Murdoch, who's married, now she's about 40 years old, Chinese-American woman. But this is not an uncommon phenomenon. There are two sort of network heads, I think, who recently married uh, very much younger, beautiful, young uh, Asian women. So what I decided, I was going to explore that phenomenon. And so you have uh, uh, the white male who's uh, named Jack Heller, and he's a very powerful, wealthy, smart, smart-ass uh, man, 70 years old, and he's being set up on a date with Scarlett Maury Yang, who uh, is this beautiful, 33-year-old, smart, uh, runs a nonprofit organization, and stylish, uh, and they meet, you know, and, and sort of do battle as to why each of them wants to be in this kind of situation. Um, but again, it's the, the idea of trying to explore kind of new contemporary issues that I'm interested in, that I want, want to explore. At the same time, you know, I'm writing an opera about uh, time travelers, so <laughs> it was anything but Asian. You know, I don't know what he is. His name's John, well, I call him Swan, Proust, S-W-A-N-N, -N, and he travels through time, and he has to go back in time to... Uh, there's actually this radio. There's this true story. Like if you watch and listen to late night talk radio, there was a guy who began to phone into the Art Bell show, and they do like parapsychology stuff. And he claimed he was from the future, and he came back in time to retrieve a computer part to bring it back to the future. But he began to call this radio show up, and, and of course everyone assumed it's a hoax. And he, but what made him different was that he was really smart, and he was able to sort of at least present arguments that were kind of believable. And he carried on this sort of uh, dialogue over one year, and then he disappeared, and was never heard from again. And so I took that idea as to, you know, kind of a time traveler. But, uh, how are we doing? Is our time okay? Oh, I guess I want to ask your take on I guess films from Asia, because like, from what I'm hearing, like, you're trying to develop like Asian American culture about how we're trying to create our own image that's separate from what the traditions of our parents, and like there are now more and more films coming in from Asia that depict like Asians who can be mistaken for. Asian Americans, like, is that a threat to whatever project you're building right now? You know, um, good question. If you've watched, you know, there's a whole thing in terms of, again, the emergence of Asian American art, but the Asian American films were, were, were one of the first forms that emerged in the late 60s, along with poster art. But, um, and initially the idea was, again, where are Asians? <laughs> you know, don't ask me where I came from. That's Asian, okay? I'm not an Oriental, you know, don't ask me any of that. Well, over the years, the film festivals that were, quote, Asian American are now Asian, Asian American film festivals. And they bring over works from, you know, from Korea, Philippines, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and they're presented as part of a program. They always distinguish what is Asian you know, and what is Asian American, but they, there's a, you know, there's actually now, where, uh, they work together. For example, Korea has been very open to bringing in Korean American artists. They, they brought over a bunch of young Korean Americans and teamed them up with uh, the native uh, Korean directors and producers you know, to create work. And so there have been some films that have come out that are this collaboration. Um, it's one of those things that just is coming. For me personally, again, I've written all about what it is to be an American. But then I'm like third generation. And I'm sort of very much farther along in terms of how I perceive the world. Now, if you're first first generation, second generation, there's a different you know the different sort of challenge uh, depending on how you want to take that. But but certainly you know film Asian American film is really very much sort of blossomed. And it also has become international, particularly the film. So I don't perceive it as a 
in any way kind of a, a threat. You know? I mean, I'm a big, big fan, you know, of, of the films. I just saw this amazing film, this Thai film called Chocolate. Have you seen it? It's, a, it's sort of like a martial arts film, <laughs> but Google it. And Netflix, it's an amazing martial arts film coming out of Thailand. So it's a mixture of kickboxing. <laughs> I, I assume like answers no. Yeah, you because know, I'm thinking like you know even with you know um, French films, German film, you don't see American you know actors being like, oh my gosh, we're being threatened. You know what I mean? And I think it's pretty similar uh, in the same vein. You know, because I'm a huge fan of Chai Yong Fat, for example. You know what he did back in the '80s and '90s in Hong Kong specifically. It's just like, oh my gosh, you are just a man. You know what I mean? So I mean, if anything, it's it's really I mean. Yeah, it's still the kung fu genre, you have the action flick hero, but... Chan Wu, man. The whole Chan thing of like... Oh, yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah. The double, yeah, absolutely. There's something, there's, what I love about, and, and those are the specific films that I like uh, that are coming into the country. And what I like about it is, yeah, the Asian male, we are hot. <laughs> 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 Definitely, you know, with the commercials and everything, so. Absolutely. So, yeah. um, Thank you very much for being here, and, and I really appreciate the stories you told about your parents uh, and the conflict, the generation of conflicts, because I think that the way stories about conservative Asian parents get narrative about it often sets them up as sort of demonic, like conservative others, and, and I think you really humanized your parents, and I'm really grateful for the way you told your stories. Um, what I wanted to ask about is, is or maybe point to it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is the way whiteness sometimes goes unmarked in, in the way we talk about theater. Um, when we talk about classical theater, you know, you say, I just want to act, I want to do Chekhov and Shakespeare. Is, by calling it classical theater, does it not become, do we not sort of erase it, its whiteness? And, and, and we know that Shakespeare was thinking in terms of race when he, he wrote um, Othello, so it's not that that racial dynamic is not there to to these quote unquote classics. So how do we when 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 we say I just want to act, does does that produce brilliant theater or, or that more people need to write great worlds for Asians and Asian Americans? Or or what I mean that's such a good question. You know it's interesting because um, uh, I think especially the public theater in New York, um, Shakespeare if anything um, they seem to be doing more, uh, people who are producing Shakespeare plays, they seem to be doing more than non-traditional casting than any of the contemporary stuff, which I think is interesting, you know. Um, but I, I, I remember when I first came to Chicago about three and a half years ago, Time Out Magazine had an article on the very uh, the, uh, the front uh, cover, it said, why is Chicago theater so white, you know? And it, uh, 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 they were talking to the people from the Goodman, Snap Wolf, et cetera, et cetera. And when they were, um, and it was the first Murakami play that Galati directed um, before uh, Kafka on the Shore. Erica Daniels, as a casting director for um, uh, Steppenwolf, said, "Where are the Asian actors? Show me, show me the Asian actors here in Chicago, and I will hire them." You know, and I was just like, "Really? You couldn't find them?" You know, but you know, whatever. Um, but I, th I think I think it's a little bit more complex than just you know, um, why is Chicago theater so white in terms of no, it's it's sort of like, um, well, one of the things that uh, Philip and I were talking about before we uh, came in here today was that you talk to a majority of the Asian uh, actors and writers. They always are an actor, but their undergrad major was something completely different. You know, it's like I'm an aerospace engineer. You know, <laughs> and, but I'm an actor. You know what I mean? We have this like uh, dual lives that we live because part of it is. You know, um, we, we've done what our parents have told us to do. You know, we, we, we've, um, we went to college, we did the major, and there was an avoid, I guess, and we finally said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. And it's getting larger and larger, but uh, a part of it is our voices haven't been heard yet because our, our stories haven't been told yet either. You know, it's, hard to, it's hard to say where are the minority plays, for example, the Asian American plays, when, I mean, I think, you know, I think, I don't think in terms of people who are writing for, for our specific voice. You know what I mean, Rana? So I, 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 it just seems that, um, let's see if I can clarify this. It just seems that it's not as simple as, you know, um, 
Yeah, it's, it, it's the idea of our stories have been told because where we are in this country, Japanese American, we're going into, we have to be a doctor, we have to be a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Julia, uh, Julia Cho, uh, who did the um, mm -hmm. um, play that just did it last year at Silk Road, um, Rio Grande. Rio Grande. Anyway, uh, she, she is a uh, Asian American writer. She was actually writing for the West Wing for a while. You know, she was telling stories about how when she um, when she went to Juilliard for her studies to become a writer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and she was at a party one time, and uh, yeah, she was talking with the doctor, and the doctor goes, "Oh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, you know writing something. One day. You know, I'm thinking of um, just telling my story, writing a play." And she goes, "Oh, that's funny because I'm thinking of being a doctor tomorrow." <laughs> you know, just like it's really that simple. You know what I mean? It's, a, it's a time. It's the energy. It's the finances that goes into being a Julia Cho, you know, being that writer, our parents are willing to pay for that. But, you know, it's like, it's, it's that world that um, a lot of it is our voices have to be heard because the works are out there. You know? there, is, there is an ample supply, but still, compared to African-American voices, white voices, you know what I mean? And it really is a dirt. Maybe one last question to wrap up. Yeah. All right, well, let's thank our speakers.